All right. I think we're live. Good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Pike, and this is our midweek Bible study. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's. So we are continuing with our study of Second Peter, if you want to be turning there. We are in chapter 2. Um, so like I say, be turning there, and we'll get to it in just a minute. I want to go through our announcements and prayer requests. Um, Wave of announcements, like I say, Sunday school starts at 9 a.m., services at 10. Um, we are also continue, even though we're inside, we're continuing to do our live transmit over FM 87.9 for those in the parking lot and nearby. Um, also, um, we post it out on Facebook. We believe we got all the bugs worked out on that. And, of course, I also do the midweek on, on Facebook and also put it out on YouTube. During the month of March for the Samaritan's First Christmas shoe boxes. We're collecting the hygiene items, um, so you pick some up, this whole, and you want to bring some extra to the church. The boxes in the high wall. Remember, no liquids or any gels. Um, they'll automatically pull those out. Um, so, like I say, if you're buying for the shoe boxes, no liquids, no gels. Um, then also, we're continuing to support the food pantry. Mm, excuse me, sponsored by the Methodist Church. So, continue that. That box is also in the, in the um, hallway. Birthdays and anniversaries, March 9th, um, Marlo Shipman, and also March 9th, Ethan Mark Mar. So we wish them both a happy birthday. Um, we have prayer requests, Marianne Edwards, Jada Clayton, Karen Clegg, David and Connie Warren, um, Matthew and Jennifer Ward, Mac McMorrow, Shannon and Daryl Brick, Chloe Akers, Janet House, Billy McKenzie, Linda and Cornelius Hunt, The Frisch Family, Kyle Edwards, Ashley Blanks, Lee Stevens, Cynthia McMorrow and family, Ashley and Zaley Emmon, B.J. Norris, Tommy Eford, Rosemary Taylor, Louise and Ron Rising, Melody Oakley, Jennifer Milligan, Sheila Milligan, Hunter Kenlaw, Jim Miss Kelly, Ruby Johnson, A.J. and Cheryl Barker, Barbara Walters. Continue to remember Miss Barbara. She's had two more eye surgeries. Um, still not having much luck. Um, I shouldn't say luck. Um, they're just not having much success with her eyes. Um, so she is going to a physician in Pinehurst in about two weeks. Um, so keep her in your prayers. Um, Frederica Aswell, um, Liliana Brutus and family, Mary Beard, Earl Davis, Dwayne Milligan, Jeanette Allen, Wayne Harris, Chase Andrews, Paula Terry, Tina Chase and Sherlane Hammonds, Pauline Davis, Robert Davis, Diane Jackson, Angie Baxley, Angie's continuing her mending and healing. Still where he goes, a way to go. Melissa Johnson. Mickey Smith, Robert Smith, Richard and Deborah Holbrook, Albert Gibson, um, our school system, the pulpit committee, our church, the laws, nation, its leaders, troops and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their families. And also, um, today um, is election day. So we're praying God's also sending us good leaders as we're starting the election process. Um, adding to that, um, Shirley Freeman, um, like I say, Ken Eric took him to the hospital by ambulance. Shirley was coming home Sunday evening, Sunday afternoon, um, and got in an accident. Um, so like I say, um, she's all right. Um, the car's not, but that can be replaced. But like I say, just remember her. Ken is still in the hospital the last of her. Hopefully they've got him home, but if not, to rehab. Um, Larry Johnson, um, and then also remember the fans the families of Reverend Ron Murdoch, um, the family of Nancy Wallace, and then the family of Rachel Jones. Um, so like I say, um, we had that all hit right there on top of us. Um, Tommy and Paula Higgins, praise report. Both got good reports. Um, continue to pray for Dalton McCown. Um, he's recovering from his issues. Um, remember Miss Patsy um, was battling. Um, remember Bethany Hooker. I'm also a continuing member of Karen. She's going through therapy and had some issues. Also, member Howard um, Butler um, is recovering for his procedure. Um, Tammy um, mentioned that her sister will have to have another ablation at some point. Um, so, like saying, we also have a grandson that's three years old that they're asking for prayer for. Um, so, remember those. Um, I know we have personal and private concerns. I know that there are those that we're praying for for salvation. Obviously, that we, it's one thing to pray for spiritual healing and spiritual things. But also, we need to be praying for the spiritual. I think I said that backwards. 
You can pray for the physical healing. You can pray for the physical needs and whatnot. But we need to be praying for the spiritual healings as well. Um, the, spirituals, the spiritual healings are what is eternal. Um, so we need to keep that in, trans, in you know, our conscience. Um, like I say, be praying um, for this election. Like I say, the process started here in North Carolina today with the um, primary. Um, there was some open voting, obviously, early, early voting there, obviously. One of the things we need to be praying for, and I've mentioned it several times, um, you know, one of the things that happens to a nation that turns away from God, God takes away its leadership, and we need God to turn his eyes back upon America and bless us with good leadership. Not who we want, but who God wants. we got to pray for God's will to be done. Um, so that reminds me of you, don't vote your wallet, vote your Bible. Um, like I say, you cannot go wrong when you vote according to God's will and what his leading is. So, like I say, keep that in mind. Um, also, like I say, issues over in Israel, with that whole Israel and Gaza war, over in the Strait with the Houthis, how we say that, um, in Ukraine, there's just wars all over the place and just needless killing of so many innocent people and attacks on innocent people. So like I say, we just need to be in prayer over that um, and pray that God's will be done. Um, so with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your many blessings. Father, we just praise you and give you the glory. Guide us and direct us, Lord. Help us to do thy will. And Father, we lift up those on our prayer list, Lord. We just pray that you'll bless them, Lord. Father, we have those who are recovering from procedures. Others have been in accidents. Others who, Father, are battling with long-term issues, with cancers and heart issues and diabetes and lung issues and blood issues, the list goes on. But Lord, we also are giving you praise because there's those sitting in the congregation that are sitting as members of the church that can give a testimony of you bringing them through those things and bringing them healing. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them. Bless them with that same healing that you've given others before, Lord. And Father, we pray. We pray for those in the church, Lord, that are in need of spiritual healing as well as physical. It's easy to remember the physical healing. It's easy to remember the material needs. But, Father, we need to remember the physical. And, Father, or the spiritual, we pray for the souls, Lord. We pray for the healing of those who are backslidden. We pray for the resurrection of those who have never called on Jesus to be saved, Lord. For they truly are made alive when they call on Jesus to be saved. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them. And we pray a conviction upon their heart. And Father, we pray also this evening, as I reminded them Sunday, we, we have not because we ask not. And Father, I've asked them and challenged the church to pray to you, to ask you to show them who to pray for, to show them who to invite the church, who to witness to, who to minister to, who to help. And Lord, we just, unless we ask you, we're not. So I've asked them to ask, and I pray that they're obedient to your answer as you're leading them to these individuals. And Father, we pray. We pray for our nation. We pray for a healing of our nation, Lord. We can pray for all the different things of our nation that are going on, but Father, first and foremost, we pray for the salvation of our nation, the repentance of our nation to turn back to you, Lord. And Father, we pray for the violence to cease within our nation, that we will not look upon each other with hatred, but with love. Open our eyes to see individuals and people and not all the different things that we use to separate and justify our evil actions. Father, I pray for us to draw together as a nation to help one another. And Father, we pray. We pray for our leaders from the top to the bottom, Lord, and we pray for the to send them wise counselors to lead them according to your will, and we pray that they'll be obedient to you, Lord, but most of all, if they do not know Jesus, we pray that you'll bless them. 
We pray that you'll bring someone in their lives to lead them somehow to you, Lord, that they may find Jesus. What a wonderful thing it would be to have a leadership of our nation, all Christians calling on your name. And Father, we pray for our military, wherever they're serving around this world, our men and women. Father, bless them. Keep them safe. Protect them from the enemy, Lord, that would bring them harm. Many are within arms, harm's way. Keep them safe, Lord. Bless them. And Father, we pray. Pray that you'll confuse the enemy. Confound their efforts, Lord. Bring them home safe at the end of their tours, our men and women, Lord. And Father, we pray for these different war zones and battles around the world. We pray that the innocents will not be hurt, will not be killed. But unfortunately, we continue to see this destruction. Father, only you can protect them. We pray that it be thy will that you protect them to bring these wars to an end. Father, we pray for your mercy and your grace. And Father, we pray for our schools and our children in schools. Watch over and keep them, Lord. May our schools be places of learning, growing, and maturing. May the children be safe from harm, protected from the, do the drugs and the violence and all the things that the enemy would throw at the schools, Lord. Protect them and keep them. And Father, we pray that the children will have food to eat. We pray that they'll have a home to come home to that is safe. With food on the table and a warm place to lay their head at night, Lord. Bless them and keep them, Lord. And Father, we pray for all of our first responders here at home. Our police officers, our firefighters ambulance drivers, all those who help those in their time of need, bless them, Lord. Guide and direct them in all their efforts. May at the end of the day, they come home safe and complete to their families, Lord, and their friends. Father, we thank you for your many blessings. God us and direct us in this Bible study. May we be moved to do thy will in all things, Lord. Strengthen us in our wisdom and our understanding so that we can discern from the false teachers from the real teachers. Guide us and direct us, for it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Like I say, um, we're getting into... Hmm, nose is wanting to drip. Seems like every time I start this, my nose wants to drip. Um, our last section of this, um, we've been talking about the apostates, um, the false teachers, and we've been discussing their reviling and their reveling, and tonight we're going to talk about their revolting. Um, so we're in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 14, and we're going to pick up the last half of 14 and read to 16. And it says, In the heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Basor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with a man's voice for bad, the, the madness of the prophet. Now, we'll get into that a little bit more as we get on over in the latter part of this and all, but right now we're going to start down in the front part of the scripture. It says they have abandoned the right road. You know, that's what they're saying. They've abandoned it. They're going the wrong way. That's the Phillips translation. They have abandoned the right road. Um, the apostates know the right way. They know the straight path of God, but they have established it, then they will it deliberately divert from it. They will, you know, deliberately abandon God's way for their own way. Um, and this is what um, Peter will refer to them. You'll see different references um, to them in different places in Peter, and he'll talk to them, and he'll call them the natural brute beast. He compares them to animals, and psalmist, the psalmist in 32 and 9 says, Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, 
The horse likes to rush ahead and the mule likes to lag behind. But both can get you off the wrong path. Um, so like I say, be careful. We as believers are sheep and sheep need to stay close to the shepherd. Remember, the shepherd don't walk behind them saying, hey, come over here or hey, come over No, the shepherd walks ahead of them and they follow. They know his voice and they'll follow him. They can put these great flocks together and the shepherds walk up and start talking and the sheep will separate and come to their shepherd because they know his voice. Do you know the voice of your shepherd, Jesus Christ? I wonder how many Christians really do. But here, what we're learning, and, and all is for, that, that for one reason or the opposite, they're, they're false teachers, the godless conduct that they have. They want to satisfy their cravings of the flesh, and all, but they also have a second reason. They are covetous. And this term we don't use very often, although we know what it is to covet, and all, but they're covetous, and they want to exploit people for their personal gain. You ever know anybody do that? You know, we used to call it stepping on somebody to get ahead. Um, and Peter mentioned this in Second Peter 2 and 3, and, and he's going to develop that thought tonight as we go through this a little bit. Not only is the false teacher's out, outlook controlled by his passions, as we stated earlier in 14a from last week, but his heart is controlled by covetedness. He is in bondage. And we talked a little bit about this in our Bible studies and other messages recently the bondage of sin the bondage of greed you can have all different types of bondage with all us bondage of sin and the sad thing is most people don't even know they're bound up by sin because they're satisfying a personal lust a personal desire a personal pleasure and in, in fact they're in bondage to it and so like I say this false teacher he's in bondage to the lust and pleasure of money Oh, wasn't that a great one? Think about all the different things. And all and the fact is that he's so in love with it that he has perfected his perfected his skills and how to get money. And I promise you it's not by honest work. And all the Phillips translation New York actually give us different ones, and it's interesting when you go and you pull the other translation because they help us get a broader picture. It says they are experts in greed. Wow, can you imagine being an expert in greed? That's an interesting expertise, right? And then the Philip translation is a little bit more graphic. It says their technique of getting what they want is through long practice, highly developed. It didn't happen overnight. They've been working on it. It's, you could call it a trade. You could call it a, you know, whatever you want to call it, a skill set now. Because they know exactly how to motivate people to get what they want and to give them their money. Ever made a slick talker, you know, a smooth talker, you know? Um, what was it on Popeye? The man says, I'll gladly pay you, Wimpy, pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today, you know, and people would buy it for him. He was good at it. Others, you know, they figured it out after a while, and all that was sort of became a joke, but I guess, hey, these people are smooth talkers. Now, as the true servants of God, we trust the Father to meet our needs, and the true servants of God are going to, you know, understand and seek God's help and, you know, grow through their giving. The apostate, the, the false teacher, he trusts his fundraising skills. And he leaves people in more shape than he found them. You know, we get blessings and, you know, different things and we can help people become better. Remember, when you're in God, you're building up. When you're in sin, you're tearing down. So you can watch in a church and you see different things going on in a church and you see what ministries are in God because you see a building up and you see which ministries are personal and you see a tearing down. And I've seen plenty of tearing down in churches across this association. Not, you know, the entire church, but I'm just saying we see it and I hear it and came across it, you know, years ago. Um, so like I say, they're good at it. And that's why the commentary calls it, they're great at fundraising skills. And guess who the fundraising's for? Themselves. They are good at, and all, at exploiting the unstable and the innocent people and everything. They'll, they know how to get in someone's wallet, so to speak. Now, 
There is nothing wrong with a legitimate and a God-fearing ministry to share its opportunities and needs with the believers. There's nothing wrong with that and with praying friends, paying, praying friends that hopefully will support the ministry. You know, there's some different people that I know that support different radio ministries, and some radio ministries are worth supporting. Others, I'm not so sure. Now we have TV ministries and internet ministries and all, but they're all basically the same things. They're radio ministry, and some are worth supporting, and some you just better leave them alone at all. And I'm sure that all of us have gotten from time to time communication from different people. Hey, we're going to do this with our ministry. Will you come and support us at all? And we, and we have to be careful with those things. And, you know, there's those that we can support and understand because, you know, well, we understand how they operate and that's a good ministry and it's a good church. You know, the money, you know, for that ministry goes to where it's needed. It's not, you know, pocketed in any percentage. That's the thing that always bothers me. You know, people will set these things up, but they pocket a certain amount. You know, and I know there's expenses and everything, but... It's ridiculous the amount that some people pocket thinking they need it. And there's a lot of different groups, you know, that go around and they'll exploit or, or not exploit, they'll expose certain, um, what am I looking for? I just lost the word, um, charities or, or churches or ministries. They look at all these different things and say, hey, yeah, you give X number of dollars, but only X number of cents you know, goes to the actual work. The rest of it goes into administrative and salaries and all these other things. You know, if you're going to do that and you recognize that yeah, there's a need to handle some of that, you know, there's always overhead costs, but is what they're showing is the overhead really a, a fair number, right? I think Girl Scout cookies is, you know, one that I think that somebody there has just exploited the Girl Scouts. To the nth degree, I'd rather just give them five dollars or six dollars for whatever the cost of the book, you know, the box of cookies is, and just say keep it, and you pocket the whole six bucks for your group. And I've been told, no, we can't do that. We have to send the money. I'm like, I'm giving you a donation to your group, your specific group. I know. And then some of them have a hard time understanding how that how that works because they've been so programmed. You sell cookies. It's sad. The cookie man manufacturers are making out on that deal, I promise you. And, uh, they're doing well um, from everything I've seen over the years. So like I say, but there's ministries out there we can trust and there's others that aren't so trustworthy. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, all of us pray and support the ministries we do trust and are led by God to invest in and, you know, and the thing with it, it's not something you go around bragging and boasting, oh, I support this one and I support that one, because if you do, you've got your reward here on earth. And you've laid no treasure up in heaven. A lot of these charities, a lot of these ministries, don't publicize it. If God's led you to support them, support them. If somebody asks you, is there a good ministry to support, you can tell them about, but don't go bragging on how much you do or whatever. Don't cast away your blessings so that you get recognized and get some limelight. Side note on that, just put that over in your pocket and keep that one, right? If you want to lay up treasure in heaven, then you do it. And you don't publicize it. You don't want to get to praise the man at all. So like I say, obviously God leads us to certain ones, and we do that. But also God has raised us up. So that, and he's given us a brain. I think so many times Christians forget, no, unless God tells me directly, it's okay. No, he's given you a brain. He's given you one that works, that thinks, and can, and all. One of the terms here that I want you to understand is discernment. God has given you a brain to be able to have discernment about different things. And part of that is in which ministries you want to invest your blessings into. Um, and that's what... God has done. He's given you this brain that you can discern and say, this is a worthy one. This is one, obviously, that is led by God. I see all the handprints of God all over this one. And this one, I'm not so sure about. I'm not going to touch that one. Now, Peter wrote about all these devious practices of these people, these false teachers. And, and he could only exclaim, cursed children. 
They were not the blessed children of God, but cursed children of the devil. Now, they may succeed in building up their bank accounts, but in the end, the throne of God, they will be declared bankrupt. You may be monetarily rich, but you could be spiritually bankrupt. And these false teachers are going to be spiritually bankrupt because they're not going to have nothing when it comes to day of judgment. Remember, Scripture tells us, Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's in Matthew 25, 41. And then it says, For what? A man is profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul. That's Matthew 16, 26. We're reminded of these things. If the riches and the material things of, worth, of the earth are not worth the, what they can drag you down to if they become your masters. Now, the problem with covetedness is it's an insatiable desire. You get a little bit, more you want more. Get a little more, you want more. Get a little more, you want more. You know, it's sort of like the millionaire. He makes his first million. What does he want to do? Make another million. Makes that million, then what do you want? Make another million. It's never enough. Never enough money. Never enough power. Never enough prestige. The covetous heart is never satisfied. If you are never satisfied, and all you're saying it's not enough, then you need to examine your heart because odds are you have a covetous heart. And this gives us an understanding why you know the love of money is the root of all evils. You know because one, it right off the bat breaks the first two commandments. You, you know you've you've already made money a god and an idol. And once you start that step of breaking, it just continues. Because later, as that covenant grows, what's going to happen? You're going to steal, lie, commit adultery, whatever it takes. Take God's name. Everything it takes in order to get more. There's commercial on TV, and I thought, man, I just... And I know it's part of the show, right? What is it? Survivor. I forget what season they're in, whatever. And they're doing excerpts or whatever and and everything and it's yeah, true it's all a game of deception and trickery as well as some other crazy stuff I really don't really get into watching it and you know, I've watched it because nothing else but even then it's it's good nap time right but the the commercial is and they're talking about this and that and and the one girl and he, the one guy saying you got 18 people and you're you know and it's all a game of deception and then they flips to these different excerpts from there and the one girl exclaims all you have to do is lie I'm thinking and we call it entertainment used to acting was entertainment now we get into all this dissociation and literally lying to somebody becomes entertainment Isn't that horrible? But when you're coveted, when you have a covetous heart, lying is no big deal. It's just another step to the end, to the means to the end. And so it's why you, you don't have to wonder when you start thinking about why Jesus warned, take heed and beware of covetedness. That's in Luke 15, you know, 12 and 15. A person wrote an excellent example of this picture. And I thought this was neat. I'd heard this years ago and when the commentary brought up, I said, I gotta re-express this one. The people in North Africa, they developed a clever little trick on how to catch monkeys. Now monkeys can get quite problematic if you get too many of them. And so occasionally they'll round them up, catch them, and I don't have no idea what they do with them. Don't know. But this is what they do. They take a gourd and they hang it on a tree. They tie it to a tree or secure it to a tree, however they do it, right? And they cut a hole in the gourd just big enough for the monkey to reach its hand. Just big enough. You know, you reach in there. And they put nuts in the bottom of the gourd, inside the gourd. So the monkey comes along in the evening and he, he, he smells those nuts and he reaches in with his hand to grab that nut. And he gets that nut in that fist. And he goes to pull his hand out and won't come out. And he keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. 
Guess what the monkey won't do? Open up his hand. If he opens up his hand, his hand will slide right back out the hole the way it came in. But he's so wanting that nut that he's got in the palm of his hand that he won't let go. So the people come back the next morning and what do they find? A bunch of monkeys with their hands stuck in a gourd wanting a nut. And they capture the monkeys. That is what it is to be covetous. Never enough. It's not good enough. I want more. I want more. I won't give up. Now, we might expect this from, you know, dumb animals, so to speak, but people are the same way. And a lot of times it feeds into addictions of gambling and whatever. You know, oh, I won't next, you know, the next spin, the next card, the next whatever. And I'll be rich. They're coveting something they don't have. And there's other ways of coveting that just keeps growing and growing. Peter knew his Old Testament scriptures. He had already used Noah. And a lot to illustrate some words and different things back. I'm in Second Peter earlier. And now he's going to use the prophet Balaam. Now Balaam is a very interesting character, to say the least. Um, he's found over in Numbers 22 through 25. Mysterious as one put it. He's a Gentile prophet. Now in the Old Testament, we basically see Jewish prophets, right? We see oh, one after another, Jewish prophet. Balaam is a Gentile prophet. Which automatically kind of makes him stand out a little bit in the Old Testament. And he's the perfect illustration of the apostates, the covetous, you know, mindset, the covetous practices. Now, from the outset, God told Balaam not to help Balak. Um, and at first, Balaam said, okay, I won't help Balak, Lord. I understand what you're saying. You've told me I'm not going to help Balak. And so he sent Balak's um, messengers home when he sent them to him. And then Balak sent more princes and messengers and promised more money and more honor. And, and Balaam decided to pray again about it. And recon have God reconsider the matter. The second time God tested Balaam and permitted him to go with the princes. Now it wasn't God's will to... That what he really wanted, but he said, "Okay, I'll let you go." You can call it permissive will if you want to. He wanted to see what the prophet would do. Oh, he already knew. But God allows us, you know, to make our mistakes, right? So Balaam jumped at the chance. But when he started to go astray, God rebuked him, and the disobedient prophet. You know, through the mouth of the donkey. Remember the story of the donkey? The donkey said, no, I won't get over it. And he says, do you not see the angels with the fiery swords in front of us? They're going to kill me if I move forward. You know, Balaam was all upset as donkey because he wouldn't go. And he was pushing him against the wall and everything. And he was hurting. And he's like, you know, you dumb donkey. And he says, what do you mean? I'm not dumb. I can. And he speaks to him with the voice of a man and tells him, there's angels here. They're going to kill, kill me if I move forward. He said, I'm not so dumb. You are, really, if you think about it. And God never permitted Balaam to curse the Israelites. He allowed him to set up his altars and all the offerings and all, but he never allowed him to curse the truth. Instead, God turned Balaam's curse into a blessing. Balaam was not able to curse Israel, but he was able to tell Balak how to defeat Israel. Now you think that's kind of odd. You know, why would God let, you know, the enemy know how to defeat his people? This is all that Balaam told um, Balak. All the Moabites have to do is invite the Jews to be friendly neighbors. 
and share in her feast. Instead of maintaining its separated position, what happened with Israel? They compromised and joined in with the pagan orgy, orgies and different practices of the Moabites. And see, God used the Moabites to test Israel's faithfulness to him. And given the opportunities, they jumped at worshiping other gods because of the physical lust and desires of the flesh. That's how Israel was defeated. Not in war, but by the turning of their heart away from God. Now, you can see in Balaam the two aspects of the apostasy that Peter is emphasizing here, right? The sensual lust and a covetedness. Um, Balaam loved money, and he led in Israel into a lustful sin. You go back and study the practices of, you know, the Moabites and how they worshipped and their temple prostitutes and all the different things. You'll realize, yeah, he led them right into a physical pleasure of what many of them consider physical pleasure, physical, sensual lust. But what did Balaam get out of this? Money. Now, if he was a good prophet, he could have, you know, told the people of God the, the warnings and led them away from it. But instead, he gave Balak the answer, and Balak led him astray. And like I say, ba Balaam is very interesting. You know, he was he could get messages from God as a Gentile. God spoke to him. Yet he led the people of God away from God and showing them the Moabites, right? But you have to be impressed with his eloquence because he is also um, deliberately um, he's deliberately honest at times which makes me like, like I say he was an interesting character um, he deliberately disobeyed God but then what's he said Balaam says I have sinned he turns around and says I have sinned I mean, he admits it but it's not really a true confession not sincere he even prayed to God and said, let me die the death of the righteous. How can you die the death of the righteous if you will not live the life of the righteous? Kind of a contradiction, right? Well, that's sort of the way Balaam was. Now, because Balaam counseled Balak how to seduce Israel, God saw to it that Balaam was judged. God gave me the answer. Balaam had a choice whether to tell him or not. And he took it because if he told him, he got the money. What happened to Balaam? He was slain by the sword when Israel defeated the Midianites. Now, I wonder who got all that money that Balaam had accumulated by turning away from God and prophesying to these other countries. A lot of money. All bad wealth earned from the devious. Now Peter calls this the, the wages of unrighteousness. And it reminds us of another pretender. Mm, a more recent one. Judas. He received the money of what they call the money of iniquity. And also perished in shame because memory hung himself upon the tree and then fell in his, you know, disgusting sight. And see, we need to understand, we don't need to ignore this lesson from Balaam, but too many people look and they see it as a neat little story, you know, the donkey talks and all this different stuff. You have to see, he was a rebel against the will of God. He went against the will of God. God says, no, don't help him. And he still wanted to because they were offering him money. Like most false teachers, Balaam knew the right way. But he rebelled against it deliberately and chose the wrong way. Because that's what made him the money. He kept playing with the will gone by trying to get a different viewpoint. Balaam was a snake. 
Fast talker. And he loved to get that money. And that was his downfall. Now, without doubt, Balaam had a gift from God that was true because he, you know, like I say, he gave some later, gave some beautiful prophecies about the, um, Jesus and everything, but he prostituted that gift to base to gain unjust riches. Everything was good except his heart. It was greedy. It was covetous. He couldn't get enough. I want more. I want more. I want more. There's a story of a bank officer approached a junior clerk and secretly asked him on the hush, if I give you $50,000, would you help me alter the books? The young clerk replies, yes, I guess I would. The man replied, would you do it for a hundred dollars? He said, of course not, the man said. What do you think I am, a common thief? And the bank officer said back to him, we've already determined that. Now we're talking about the price. Yeah. Everybody's got a price. How much does somebody have to pay you? What is it worth to you to deny God? To hide your faith from the rest of the world. You have to think about it. Do you have a price? It's a scary thought, but I imagine most people do. Because all they got to do is show you dollar signs. All they got to do is show you the luxuries that you can have. And many, many a Christian will turn from their faith. Because their faith is weak. That's why they can do it. And their heart is coveting. And they're after a sinful desire. It will pull them down. Now, in this, we're getting towards the end of this section. Peter has condemned three sins of the false teachers. They're reviling. They're reveling and they're revolting because this, it says what? They know the right way. And they deliberately go the other way. Away from God's will. They know the right way. That is revolting. All of the sin springs forth from the pride and selfish desire. Now, a true servant of God, a, new, a true follower is humble and seeks to serve others. See, how many times do you actually find yourself seeking to serve somebody else? We'd like to be waited on. We'd like people to serve us. But how many times do you earnestly seek out somebody that you can serve? That's a true mark of a humble servant of God. They seek to serve others. The true servant of God does not think about the praise or the pay because he serves God from a loving and obedient heart. I don't need to hear this. I don't need that. I don't need everybody to say, oh, you're so great. No. All they want to know is that they're, is that they're blessing God. That they're being obedient to him. And they'll honor him. See, the true servant of God, really, it goes back to, you know, being just like Jesus. He models himself after Jesus. And in this last day, we got to be weary of it because in these last days, there's going to be a ton of false preachers coming out of the woodwork. False preachers, false teachers, liars, manipulators, connivers, whatever you want to call them. And the churches are going to be full of them at times. The stronger the church is, the more that it's pulling for God the more apt it is to get invaded by these people because Satan wants to stop that movement towards God. 
These false teachers, remember, are gifted and inexperienced at the trade that they practice. So they can even bring down the strongest of Christians sometimes with their deceptions. Now, I think it's good that there's out there, there's agencies and different people that go about and they look at the different things and they're good at exposing religious rackets and charity rackets and different things. I think those are great. But hopefully after reading this, after this Bible study, you have a greater discernment for these things. And of course, you always can pray, Lord, give me the discernment I need to separate the bad from the good. How many times are you praying that one? Were you thinking, oh, it'll be so obvious I can figure it out? Think on that one. But also remember, one day, you can sit there and say, but they have all this money. They have all these wells. They have the boats, the cars. They have all this. Lord, it's not fair. Remember one day. They're going to be dealt with just like animals. They'll be taken and destroyed. A lot of you may be saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I understand it. See, their heart is not, they're in the church, but their heart is not in God. They're, they're not believers. They're not true believers. They're liars. They're deceivers. And all their hearts are black. They're there to manipulate and exploit people for their own good. So God has a judgment waiting for them. And they will be taken and destroyed, so to speak. they will receive the reward of unrighteousness. To compensate them for the wages that they have exploited of others. So you can see that it's going to be a sort of a very negative thing to take away all their riches, so to speak. They'll be banished. Cursed children. This is where you got to get understand what it is. And I think some of us understand this. Cursed children here, that's the term Peter used. They're going to be banished from the presence of God forever. They are marked men and women. They will not escape. Their eternity in hell is going to keep them from the presence of God. That's horrible. We can't even imagine what it is to be separated from God. We can't imagine it because we never experienced it. Even in our sinful state, we're still in the presence of God. He was still working to bring us to him. He was pursuing us. So we never experienced God turning his back on us. Be thankful for that. But these cursed children will not escape. Now, we've studied the three R's of the apostates and their sins. And I pray that none of this you've seen yourself in, none of this is like, oh, that's I do that. I, just, I, I hope you have not seen that. If you are, please get in prayer and get into the Lord and all. And take the Lord and say, Lord, remove that from me. I don't want to be one of reveling, ri rivaling, and revolting. That's not where I want to be, Lord. I want to be a true Christian, a follower of you. So look at yourself, look at your practices, and make sure you don't follow under these three R's. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it's so good to have Peter teaching us and the Holy Spirit guiding Peter as he teaches us. Lord, I pray that you'll watch over us, protect us, and keep us that we can do all things according to your will. Father, we love you and we need you in our lives. Let us always remember and call on you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Have a good night and God bless.